right, um, my name is Andy Galpern. I am the founder of Cascade SF. We're basically, uh, um, well, thank you. We're an organization dedicated to teaching the latest tips and tricks in the web design industry. So that would cover um, user experience design, front end development, content, everything for the web. And usually I am the one who is introducing other people. Tonight I'll be introducing myself. So let's move on. And designing for your mom, I want everybody to give me a round of applause for us getting started. Yay. Here we go. My name is Andy Galpern, as mentioned. I'm the founder of Cascade SF. I'm also a UX UI designer. I call myself a strategist because I like to think of different ways to kind of get the user engaged. And you can find me on Twitter at Andy Galpern, at Cascade SF to keep up with our events. Tonight is the first night of UX night. We're going to be having these events continuously and basically teaching everybody about user experience. And we would like for any of you guys to volunteer it, to be a speaker. If you are interested, send me an email, andy at cascadesf.com. Tonight is a big night. Tonight is a really big night, guys. And the reason that it's a big night is because tonight I'm going to introduce you to somebody very close to me, very near and dear. And uh, she's been a part of my life for my whole life. And tonight you're going to meet my mom. Hi. Hit it, lady. <laughs> <laughs> this is Stacy Galpern. This is my mom. Um, yes. I guess I'm just going to cross this. It's fine. OK, she lives in Hollywood, Florida. That's where I'm from. She worked as an elementary school teacher for 25 plus years, just retired last week. She adores her family, and that's all of us. She loves to travel. And more than anything, she really loves a travel deal. Yes. So she goes on the Google, she types with two fingers, and she looks up hotel deals in San Francisco. And she finds this mess. <laughs> Travelocity. Can any of you guys actually tell me? Well, first of all, we are going to talk about design tonight, just so you know. Not, it's not just about my mom. But <laughs> I'm, I'm clicking the wheel and going very slowly to try to not go to many pages. But OK, so can any of you guys tell me what is wrong with this design? Cluttered, okay. Yes? I don't know what's the most important part. So there's no visual hierarchy. Well, there, there is. Mm -hmm. It's the ads. <laughs> <laughs> the ads are, are taking precedence over the content. So there's no clear call to action. No call to action. Okay. My mom would say, I'm not sure where to start. Exactly. Okay, so basically, um, I'm going to tell you basically a, a trick to creating user experience design. And it's pretty, you know, it's, sim it's simple and this did come with some research. But basically, if you apply W3C accessibility guidelines and Gestalt principles, you'll create the ultimate user experience. And I'll show you where I'm coming from here. And basically, Gestalt, Gestalt principles were developed in the 20s in Germany. And they include proximity, continuity, similarity, figure, ground, and closure. We're only going to focus on four of them tonight, which are proximity, continuity, similarity, and figure, ground relationships. Are the slides going to be available at all, or should we be? The slides will be available. Okay, awesome. Yes, except for when you launch them, you get really fun music to listen to in the background. All right, so here's proximity. Um, proximity is where items are placed in relationship to one another. Now, uh, when we look at this, this example right here, um, I basically zoomed in on the one area that is the point of the whole message. The proximity is a little odd right there because we have the headline. This area kind of looks like a button. It's got like a really weird gradient if you guys were to look at it on a 
decent uh, screen because this one's a little blown out. Um, the headline should behave like a headline. They should connect to each other. If you're going to give somebody steps, you guide them. You don't stack it left to right. And also, um, can anybody else tell me what's wrong with this design? Is it hard to read? Hmm? I hear like little, little. They they do tell you, but they don't connect it well. Yeah. And, and the alignment is kind of strange too because this is right aligned, this is left aligned, this is left aligned. It's like make up your mind, people. So, also the poor use of gradients. If it's a button, no, make it look like a button. That is not a button. So why have gradients that have create separation? It doesn't make sense. Wait, say that again. What's the gradient? Um, in between each, each uh, table or whatever they created of this, um, it looks like a button because there's, like, there's a gradient that goes from light to dark here. And it creates kind of a bulge, like, tummy thingy. They're trying to create separation, you know, like the alternating zebra effect, but, but it doesn't work for this, and that usually works for long, longer lines of, of content. So um, basically, I just made it as clear and as clean as possible, and this is really the message tonight, is to simplify and group related content together so the user knows exactly what to do. Where are you visiting? I'm visiting San Francisco, I'm checking in on this date, I'm checking out on this date rooms, I want one, and then, you know, have a little bit of fun with the, the button, find me a great deal, do something that's, that not just search, but what am I doing, remind the user what they're actually doing when they press, when they go to click on that call to action. All right, and continuity, um, create the easiest path for the user to follow. We have our eyes, um, everything is aligning to the left, and that makes it a lot easier to follow. I'm going to go into this right here, and you guys are all going to thank me after you see these next slides because they're pretty useful. All right, so there was a study on UX matters, and basically they had studied how long does it take for your eye to um, be able to follow a form. And I know, have you guys, any of you guys read Mobile First or um, Web Design, um, any of Luke W's books? No? Yep. If you haven't, you should. He has a book from, um, from Rosenfeld that's very, very strong, and also the Mobile First book is excellent. And he also spoke at a Cascade SF event, uh, Americana had taped it, and it's online as well. But here you go, uh, it took 500 milliseconds for the user to process a left in line label to the left field of, in of the input fields. There's some kind of beeping going on back there. Please turn it off, thank you. All right, so there's, you see this space right here? When you left align something, it takes longer to connect the label and the actual input field. So this is the longest time. Next you have the right align labels to the left of input fields, where it took 240 milliseconds. Some of the more advanced people, it took them 170 milliseconds. So it was a little quicker, because they already knew what to do. And then if you have a left aligned label above the input field, it only took 50 milliseconds because you're able to quickly scan the information and go through it very quickly. And yay, that is the winner. We got a little clap, so yay. So what, so what does that teach you guys? Left aligned labels are above the input field. Yes, and also they said that it took a little bit longer for when the label was bolded, it actually took longer to process the information. So it's actually better not to have it bolded. All right, so also uh, continuity, create the easiest path for the user. We're looking here at um, JetBlue, which is kind of, you know, second runner up to Virgin America for me. Um, what is the issue here? Do you guys see an issue with the design? Like the left side is like maybe these are both associated with the 
the left field rather than one being associated with the left field and one being associated with the return? Like, I, I just assume that I'm picking dates for both fields or something. Awesome. Good job. Exactly. That is, where, where do I pick the date? It's like, you know, this stuff, eventually the user might fill out, but the idea behind good user experience design is that they're immediately going to figure out because there's one path. If you create, you know, you don't, the person doesn't have to stop and process information. It's just there. And you don't have, you know, my mom, where do I pick the name? I tried to limit the references to that. Okay, so here, exactly. So you, the arrow goes down here, and you're thinking that it's going to, the information is going to be here. So you immediately look here, and then you're, wait a minute, this is August, this is not July, and July is right there. So the best way to do this kind of design is to use a date picker like that. So basically you have the left and the right to be able to toggle through the months, and it goes right, you know, drops down below. Yes? Agreed, but if they're going, but it, in the sense that they're pushing it to the left where it says July, it's it doesn't work. And plus, you can always go back left and right. You know, if you're on mobile, would they would they make the screen you know or have it drop down and give you two months, or would they give you one option? Give you the user less options, and you'd be able to guide them closer to your business goals. All right. Um, I'm not sure if anybody has seen this. I know, Will, you've seen it because I showed this to you before. But um, similarity, similarity, it's another Gestalt principle. And basically, if you use repeating elements, people will know what, what they need to do. Now, um, does anybody recognize the, the colors are a little distorted because of the screen. But does anybody recognize uh, where these buttons or you can pick out basically what the brand is based on the buttons? Come on, we're going to guess. The first person to guess it correct gets a book. Wait. Hold on, wait, wait, wait. We're going to go, we're going to, okay, first of all, no, no travel sites here. So I'll just give, that's the only hint you're getting, by the way. Um, now, we're, wait, wait, so you can, this is like school, you can only talk if you raise your hand, and, and you're already excluded because you talk too much, so. No, okay, no, it's okay. What, what were you going to say? The first one is? No. Wait, we, we can't talk unless we raise our hand. Yes? Okay, you get a book, yes, yes. Thank you for having good manners. There you go. <laughs> it's okay, I do it too, don't worry. Um, yes? You got it. I would give you a book, but we only have a few to give away, so you get. Yes? Oh, I was going to say the bottom, bottom right uh, was Google. You know, it's weird because I don't remember the button. I mean, now that I'm thinking about it, maybe the sign in button on Google was red, but it's. It's the, the, yeah. The Gmail search, the Gmail used the both blue and the red hmm. for the Gmail interface. Yeah. And uh, they have really subtle gradient on their buttons and the, their their field. And they have a very little subtle corner on their field. And I think that's why I, I think it's. That's why you notice. Good eye. Unless you work, do you work for Google? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes. Ah, awesome. Did you look this up? No, no, no. Okay. Anybody else? Yes? Bottom right, is that Yelp? Nope. All right, and you know what? The bottom, honestly, the bottom left, you guys would recognize if you actually saw it on the screen. Um, it's Flickr, and this is really pink on the, on the actual uh, retina display. But I wrote down the... Here are the answers. Google, Twitter, Facebook, Flickr, and Pinterest. These are just five... Five out of, um, we have, wow. There's many, many, um, there's a whole test here. And I put the URL, of course, I'm gonna have a link to the slide. It's from medium.com and you basically take the test. I think there's like 15 different uh, design tests. And the idea is just to use consistent buttons and what was your name? Ying Ying. Yeah, what is that? Ying, oh, Ying Ying. Like Ying Ying had said, 
make sure like to note it, all the little details are what makes the brand. So try to have create that in your style guide and reuse them throughout the site so people can recognize your brand and it's easy to recognize. All right, and now we're gonna talk about readability, actually legibility. Legibility is the ability to read, to see something and be able to read it with your eyes and readability is actually the ability to process content and how smooth that it communicates. That wasn't communicated very smoothly. Here <laughs> Okay, this site is awful. I don't even know how it exists in 2013, but it's um, digitalhollywood.com. It's, yeah, I actually had to cut out the banner on the top because I, <laughs> because I wanted to show you guys what the content was. Um, I'm, I'm gonna fall asleep just reading this all the way across because it's a lot to scan. There's a rule, it's um, basically, do any of you guys program? Okay, do you use the blind text editor? Yeah, and they tell you you can actually set the width of the columns. They say that in, uh, according to the, to the W3C, they say, uh, use an 80 character rule to keep text easily scannable. So basically, you just have like 80 characters maximum. You don't want it too short because then your eyes are jumping all the time. But if it's too wide, then you're going to be like. And also, it's, it's kind of hard to read as well. So, um, except for captions and images of text, text can be resized without assistive technology up to 200% without the loss of content or functionality. And that makes sense when, because if you were to zoom in really close, you wouldn't be able to, to um, where the letting was really, really long and you won't be able to process everything. All right, um, this you guys will thank me for if you don't already know about it. This is awesome. This is one of the coolest discoveries that I have found in a long time. And this is the golden ratio of typography. And there's an actual mathematical formula to this. Or you can just go to the site, um, which is personified, pers personified typography. And um, basically, you type in the font size. You, use, you, know, you can use uh, Photoshop or InDesign or even just like measure it with a screen capture of whatever the width of the actual content is. So say that this is 700 pixels and this is size, say, 14 or 15 type, it will actually tell you what is the best optimal line height for this particular circumstance. So it is, it's awesome. It's really good for readability, and especially us, like, in, in print design, they would tell us to go, three, you know, two to three points letting. And for web design, it's a little bit different because, well, you know, it's line height, and actually there's a little bit more space in order for people to read and process content really well. All right, and who is, is anybody a designer for email blasts? Or are you too embarrassed to admit it? <laughs> <laughs> you are? Okay. So, so what are the things, um, what are the frustrations that you have with designing for? Do you, ha have you seen Litmus before? So, no, okay, yeah, so there's a tool actually, it's called Litmus, and you can use it with MailChimp or with your email client, and it will take screenshots across every browser on various devices, including mobile, and give you a preview of how it's going to look. So you basically, instead of you know having a million devices, it gives you an accurate preview. It's called Litmus, L-I-T-M-U-S. Uh, the images with, with um, the text as images is an issue, especially now we have Typekit, we have at font, you know, font import um, functionalities and CSS. There's no reason that, that Nordstrom, as beautiful as their products are, should be having type that is as an image, especially for SEO, if they want people to be able to find it on search. You can use an alt tag, but there's nothing like having the real type in the browser, in the code. There we go. And, and also, I was actually appalled. I just went on Macy's site. They must not have a lot of resources. 
but I was completely appalled. They have, this whole thing was an image. Except, except for the navigation on the top. They actually use image maps. I was really upset. Yeah, it's, it made me cry. No, um, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. This should be, you know, they, I'm guessing they don't have the resources or they just don't think that it matters that much or it's just a really fast sale that they don't think it's worth it to, to so they're gonna duplicate, I don't know. But don't, don't use text as images. It's not good for, for um, zooming. It's not good for content, for searchability. And somebody, does anybody know anybody who works at Macy's? Because I need to tell them. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you have a question? No? Okay, he's just stretching. All right, and this is actually, so I recently got um, a MacBook Pro Retina display. And once you get that, you really notice how poor image quality is if it's not saved correctly. But there's a solution for that, and try to make everything that you can, save it as in CSS3, or code it in CSS3. We have gradients, we have shadows. There's a lot of ways to get a quality, clear image, or just you know simulate what an image would look like with CSS3. So try to use that as much as possible. Import font faces, font families, and we also have CSS events, because um, I love CSS a lot. Here we go. All right, so this is kind of funny. Um, going back to my mom, separate note, uh, we're going back to Gestalt principles, which is figure and ground. It's probably one of the most important principles. And they basically it teaches you to cr use contrast to separate items, and that way you understand what is on the front, what is the next part. But it helps you separate hierarchy. But um, my mom actually understands Netflix really well, and their interface is really easy to use. And so when she was visiting me a couple months ago, she <laughs> was using Netflix, and suddenly I'm getting the worst recommendations <laughs> on. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, oh man, I don't, you know, so, so um, basically using contrast to separate items, it does help. And also this is similarity. We have a grid system, so all these are the same size. You know that they're movies or TV shows. You know that you can watch them because you're used to the sizing of everything. Go cool, next. Okay, this is really cool. Um, do you guys use Airbnb? Does anybody use Airbnb? Yeah, okay. They have, um, one of the things about accessibility that we were talking about is that it's funny, all, the, all these, um, these, you know, they say somebody's blind or deaf or they can't, you know, they can't see something clearly. It's, we're all kind of the same. We're all kind of, we need to know something this minute. We need to have the information to us right now or else it's not gonna process. And basically, when we go to hover on something, Airbnb does this. When you hover, they make it very, very, very clear. And even on the input selectors, when you go to click on an input, they, they color it in, with a pink, bright, glowing shadow. And you know that you're there. They're basically reminding you that you are on this state. They're using strong visual reinforcement to let you know what you're doing. It's very, very helpful. All right, so this is taken from the W3C. Um, in this technique, when the user places focus on an element using the mouse, tab key, arrow keys, keyboard shortcuts, or any other method, the application makes that focus more visible. Using a combination of highly contrasting color, a thick line, and other visual indicators such as a glow, so this is actually an accessibility guideline to tell people when they're going to hover over something, make sure that, that they know where they are. So always remind the user where they are, give them visual feedback. And this article is really, really useful. Um, it's a contrast and meaning article. It's um, by Andy Rutledge. He writes a lot of very useful articles. And it's from a list of heart. And he says, simply put, contrast is at the root of almost everything you'll accomplish with design. So as long as people know where they are, it's gonna make a big difference. All right, so backing up, um, just kind of wrapping things up, going back, uh, Gestalt principles, we have proximity, continuity, similarity, figure and ground. Closure is kind of like the FedEx symbol. If you guys um, saw the FedEx logo and they have the arrow, your eye automatically completes the missing piece but 
we wanted to focus on the top four today. And every design choice that you make needs to serve a clear purpose. If it doesn't serve a purpose, get rid of it. Because what is the point of it being there if it's not doing anything? It's just there. It's like a pretty, you know, pretty girl who's just not saying anything. She's just kind of in the way, but it's like nice to look at. It's like, okay, we're done. Get out. <laughs> Our goal is for everyone to understand the point of the site immediately. Whenever you guys are going to design a site, like the hardest part is in the beginning of creating a site is understanding what is the point. Say that to yourself when you're going to design something. What is the point? What am I trying to reach here? What, what am I trying to communicate? If you say that to yourself before designing anything, you'll be able to, instead of just like creating wireframe sketches, you're gonna actually write everything out and to just explain content and the, the actual writing is gonna turn into visuals. But the visuals are gonna make a lot more sense because it's all centered around functionality. Does that make sense? Yes? trying to make it as clear as possible. The other thing is kind of funny. Um, my father, he always says to me, when you're, you know, I said to him one day, Dad, I can't write. I, I don't know how to write. Or I just write and it sounds like rambling. It's like the way I talk. And he's like, you know, writing is actually very simple. All you have to do is write everything on paper and then you subtract, you edit it so it makes more sense. Then you edit it so it makes even more sense. And then you keep editing it. And then you show it to your friend and they're like, does this make sense? And they're like, yes. But um, design is the same thing. We're just creating something and then you're cutting it down, cutting it down, cutting it down. So that way you have the core of the message. And that's the most important part is just making sure that everything is clear, it's as simple as possible, it makes sense. And my mom needs to understand it as well. So it makes sense for everybody, including my mom. And the one thing, one thing I'm going to close out with here is that um, when we're designing, if you use those accessibility standards and you take a look at them and see that they're not only applicable to people who, you know, who have disabilities, they're applicable for everybody. Like Jeffrey Zeldman had said in Designing with Web Standards, design for the lowest common denominator. And that way everybody can understand it. It's not that we're just designing specifically for them on a separate site. If we have everything simple for everybody, then we'll all get the same message and it will make sense. So my mom, essentially, if I'm gonna be designing for her, I'm gonna be designing for me without the mouse click. That's, yes. <laughs> See, this, this isn't as smooth as I'm and that's all. Thank you.